Hello, everybody, wherever you may be, from coast to coast and sea to shining sea. My name's Larry. My call sign's Kilo 7 Hotel November. Welcome back to Ham Radio Live. I'd like to thank you so much for coming today. Big guest, Ray Novak from ICOM North America, be taking your questions. Plus, we've got the latest propagation conditions for ham and shortwave. What more could you ask for? Yeah. Trying to help you out in the bands as well as help you out with one of the best and biggest manufacturers in the world of ham radio. Wherever you're coming from, from around the world, I want to thank you very, very much for coming to today's show. Welcome to Shack. Here in Oregon, my name is Larry. My call sign is Kilo 7 Hotel November. Thank you for coming. Truly an honor and privilege to have you here today. Thank you very, very much. I'd like to tell you folks, if you'd like to get an amateur radio, we'd love to have you. Now, it's going to take a little bit of study. It's going to take a little time, but you can do it. You really can. All you have to do is get a hold of one of these radio groups, and they'll help you get into the hobby. Okay? One of them is the American Radio Relay League. Find them at www.a rrl.org they'll help you even if you're not in north america tell them where you are hit the contact us segment and then let them know where you're at and they'll hook you up with a radio club that's near you okay if you're over in japan contact the jarl very organized group there in japan find them at www.jarl.org if you're in the united kingdom the radio society of great britain stands at the ready to help you Find them at www.rsgb.org. And in Canada, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, right there at www.rac.ca. Folks, over in the other side of the pond, in Australia, Wireless Institute of Australia is your connection. They'll help you get connected with the Ham Radio Club and get you started so you can get on the air. You can do this. You really can. It's not so technical that you just can't do it. I promise you can do this. Our mates in Australia find the WIA at www.wia.org. If you'd like to say hello or maybe have a show suggestion, some feedback, whatever it might be, feel free and reach me at cqhamradiolive at gmail.com. I'd like to welcome you guys to the show wherever you may be from around the world. Thank you so much for coming. It is truly my honor and my privilege. Thank you guys very much. I'd like to welcome Gunter first in the house. His call sign, Delta Kilo 5, Oscar November Victor. Gunter is one of our moderators. Gunter, thank you for coming today from Germany. It's an honor and privilege to say hello to you. Thank you very much for the little dog video, too. I thought it was pretty cute. I could use a laugh right now with dog stuff, so thank you for that. Current conditions for the Hammond shortwave bands. The SFI has dropped. That was expected. It's down to 86 now, but still very workable. A index is high, okay? 13 is a number that is a little high. We'd like to see it under 10. K index down to 2. That's great because yesterday it peaked at 7. That was in the middle of the geomagnetic storm we were experiencing, which made noise floors skyrocket around the world. And boy, it was just terrible. It really was last night. Current MUF at Boulder, 17.36 megahertz. And uh, down at the very bottom, solar flare probability, 47%. That's tough right now because we do have a couple of coronal holes that are facing Earth. And the solar wind coming our way means that it can disrupt communications on the ham in shortwave frequencies. So we'll be keeping an eye out there for you on that. Current MUFs around the world in Alaska, 14.7. Boulder, Colorado, 13 point, sorry, 17.36. Ascension Island, look at that. 20.43. Athens, Greece is down now to 20.62. Earlier in the day, no joke, it was over 38 megahertz. No kidding. Over in Japan, 9.73. Nive Island is at 11.68. Darwin, Australia is at 13. Point, sorry, 19.07. Noise floors around the world currently in Canada and North America, pretty steady really is 20 and 40 meters both at s3 here in north america if you're in south america if you're on the east side brazil is at s1 on 40 and 20 on the east side in argentina you'll find a noise floor on 40 meters around s3 20 meters about s2 in europe look at that england quite a bit different than it is over in germany right now yep in hamburg germany 40 meters in 
England, S5, 20 meters S4. In Hamburg, Germany, 40 meters is S4, N20 is an S2. In India, it is an S5 on 40, S5 on 20, so quite loud. Also loud in the north part of Asia, look at 40 meters in Russia, S7, 20 is an S3. Down south, Australia Way and New Zealand, 40 meters, S5 and S3 on 20 meters. In New Zealand, it's S3 on 40, S1 on 20. In the middle of the ocean there in the Pacific, Hawaii currently at 40 meters, pretty high noise floor for them. It is quite high for Hawaii. S4 right now on 40 meters, 20 meters showing up with an S3. Forecast for today, 17 and 12, sorry, 17 and, and uh, 20 meters look good today on your hand bands. They look pretty good. Possible 15 meter openings, I just don't see it, but it's possible. Six meter e skip openings also could be possible from time to time. Tonight on the hand bands, you'll have your typical 160, 70, and 85, 60 meters, 40 meters, 30 meters, and tonight giving a 60% chance of 20 meter openings. Over the nighttime part of the earth on the SDR checks that I made this morning on the sweeps, I was hearing signals. So, good possibility you could be working some great DX tonight on 20 meters in the middle of the night. Short wave bands, daytime, 31 meters, 25 meters, 19, 16, and 13 meters. Notice 11 meters is gone. We just don't have enough of an MUF today. Shortwave nighttime frequency should be about the same as yesterday. 120, 90, 75, 60, 49, 41, 31, 25, and the 19-meter band. You'll find most of your activity on the broadcast side of shortwave on the 75-meter, 49-meter, 25-meter, and 19 meter bands. There is your forecast for today. Welcome to the show, everybody, wherever you may be. Cliff Bolts is here from the state of Virginia. Cliff, it's such a nice pleasure for me to see you. His call sign, Wilson, wow, can't say it. Whiskey Delta 4, Oscar Bravo Papa. Finally got that out. Wow. <laughs> Gee, like that one's a hard one to do. Sorry about that, Cliff. Sorry about that. All right. We're going to have Ray Novak from ICOM joining us here in about 10 minutes. Let's first go over a little bit of the history of ICOM. ICOM has been around a long time. I don't know if you realize that. I mean a long time, going back to the 50s. And they have introduced many ham radio firsts. I mean the very first for many things, okay? We'll go over those firsts right now. First of all, we're taking a look at one of their early transceivers. This is the... 700T and 700R. Yep, it was the first transceiver. Yep, it was a receiver and transmitter set. They were used, in fact, they had transistors way back. This is in 67. Transistors were new back then, and they used transistors in all stages except for the final stages of the, um, of the um, amplifier stage course. That's where the, few, the uh, tubes were. ICOM became famous for transceivers using semiconductors way back in 1967. Then the 2A, yeah, the ICOM 2A Touch came out. This is really kind of neat. The 2A was actually, it was just a, you know, regular handheld two meter transceiver. Pretty cool. And it became very popular, very popular in the 1970s. As we went on, ICOM came out with the ICOM IC270. Now, the 270, as you can see, has a digital display. Kind of cool, right? Not something that was very common back then. So the 270 was one of those that operated a CPU with a detachable front panel. Very popular and very good back at the time. ICOM kept expanding. They expanded into Dusseldorf in Germany. They expanded throughout the world as the decades went on. They literally now are located all over the world. They're from, they're all, all, of course, in Japan. They're in Asia. They've got an office now in Brazil. They have one in Mexico City. And they have offices as well in uh, Asia. So, yeah, good stuff. ICOM America is just part of the equation. They truly are. They were the first ones to put in an integrated circuit chip. 
Did you know that? Yep, they sure did. Way back in 76, they introduced their SC3062 large-scale integrated circuit chip. The complementary metal oxide semiconductor contained 6,000 semiconductor elements in a 6 millimeter by 6 millimeter scale, which was the largest of its class. It was the first step for ICOM into digital innovations. Then comes out the 21A. Now, what's so special about the 21A? Take a look over on the right. This is the first two meter radio that actually allowed you to direct entry a frequency. Before that, there was no transceiver that did that. You had to spin a VFO. Then, look at this. This is a very historic transceiver. I don't know if you realize this, how special this transceiver really is. This is the ICOM 781. It debuted in 1988. It was the very first transceiver that included what we know today as a spectrum scope. Yeah, that was way back in 1988. ICOM, way ahead of the game back then. They continued to expand all over the world. And as they did so, they continued to bring out products that revolutionized amateur radio. Here's one of them right here. The IC9100, a fantastic all-in-one radio that really did everything you ever needed to do on the HF, VHF, and UHF bands. A very, very popular transceiver. Even to this day, the ICOM 9100 is a very coveted radio. And this is a radio that maybe not many people know about. This is the IC505. It was a QRP rig. Basically, it was set for portable. You would bring it, you'd use a battery or, you know, use something on the road to help power it. It was a QRP, 10-watt rig. Sound familiar? IC705, possibly? Mm -hmm. This was the original one. It was the IC505. And it was the first QRP rig you could take on the road with you, have a lot of fun. In fact, this won the Good Design Award from gmark.org. That's way back in 1982. ICOM, still breaking ground. Then, very popular as we all know, the 756 Pro Series. There was the first Pro, then they came out with a second one and a third one. Now, this all began in 2001. All of these, whether you have the ICOM 756 Pro 1, 2, or 3, are very coveted and special transceivers to this day. And this is a special radio. This right here is a radio that celebrated ICOM's 50th anniversary. This is the ICOM 7850, not the 7851, the 7850. ICOM released this to celebrate their 50th anniversary. They intended only to make 150 of these transceivers. Take a look at the knobs. Take a look at the buttons. The buttons are all gold to celebrate ICOM's golden anniversary. What about the rest that couldn't get one? Well, later on that year, they came out with their flagship model, the IC7851. To this day, this transceiver is one of the best in superheterodyne transceivers in the world. It has optimized crystal oscillators and roofing filters to help bring in the world's toughest signals, to help fill your logbook with rare, those rare DX calls. In fact, today it remains one of the world's very top transceivers. It really does. ICOM also has done an awful lot for organizations to help people, whether they be new hams, ham clubs, or even the Boy Scouts. Yeah, ICOM actually received an award in 2015. They were honored by the United States Boy Scouts of America. Yep, they've actually helped introduce over 170,000 scouts to amateur radio. This right here is the amateur radio patch that a Boy Scout gets once they complete the amateur radio course, and ICOM is a big part of that. Then they turned ham radio literally on its ear. In, sorry, in 2016, ICOM did another first for amateur radio by producing the world's first direct sampling software-defined radio that didn't need a computer to make it work. ICOM 7300, direct sampling HF plus 6. If you're in the UK, it's course 4 meters. 
It was a direct sampling SDR that has knobs, buttons, and a spectrum scope that you can touch and control. No computer necessary. It's become one of the top-selling transceivers in the history of amateur radio. Fast forward just a little bit to 2018, and there's the bookend, the ICOM IC9700. Similar in size to the 7300, this transceiver provided the very best in receive and transmit for VHF and UHF bands, including a similar touchscreen, operating system, and full-color spectrum spoke. It was the first of its kind for a VHF UHF transceiver. There had never been a live spectrum scope on a receiver tra- or transceiver that did what the 9700 does. Plus, you also get up to 100 watts of transmit output. Man, put them side by side. You got a 7300 on one side, the 9700 on the other side, and you've got a dynamic bookend for HF, VHF, and UHF operation. ICOM wasn't quite done yet. Nope. In 2017, they came out with a dual VFO transceiver that was like the 7300, but like it was on steroids. It was the 7610, marketed by ICOM as the SDR you've asked for. It's literally got more options in it than most radios have at thousands of dollars more including diversity received. This is the lowest priced new transceiver on the market you can purchase that offers diversity received. It has excellent sensitivity and selectivity. It's an amazing direct sampling SDR, and it is a huge seller for ICOM worldwide. Fast forward to just last year, right in the middle of a pandemic, ICOM doesn't stop. Nope, they continue on. The IC705. Now, you see the heritage here? Remember, ICOM came out with the 505. Here it is. Here's the 505. Again, 10 watts, QRP. It's all set up to basically work you with QRP power. But there were improvements. On the 705, you had battery operation. You could plug it into your wall, charge it up, then use it out in the field as long as you could. Spare batteries, you can go as long as you want. They sell even an optional backpack you can purchase you can keep your extra batteries in there, some coax, even some wire antennas. ICOM has revolutionized ham radio. And I've got to tell you, I am so honored and thrilled to have this man on today. Ray Novak began at MFJ. He learned from, I think, one of the best people he could possibly learn from in ham radio, in a man named Martin F. Jew. Martin Jew help Ray get into ham radio, and from there, his natural talent simply took over. Martin helped Ray get not only his ham license, but he also helped Ray to really build a career in amateur radio. I've had the chance to talk to Mr. Jew many, many times, and one of the things that Mr. Jew talks about when he mentions Ray Novak is Ray is one of the best people there is in amateur radio. Ray Novak will be our guest today, live, taking your questions from ICOM North America. And for me, this is truly an honor to share with all of you. Ray, I think I have you here somewhere in the background. And I, you called me early. You're so good. You called me right early and you're ready to go. How are you today, Ray? Well, I don't know if I'm rip and ready to go. I was hoping to get in, uh, do a couple of tests to make sure. Audio levels were right. My video looked good. So you're just going to put me on the spot, aren't you? Well, you know, I tried to I tried to get a hold of you to do that, buddy. I I did. I tried to get that get that set up for you. So <laughs> this is this is the time we we we're doing the show, and I and I appreciate you. I guess flying by the seat of your pants here, but you do sound just fine. And I have a picture of you, the same picture we have of you on QRZ. Ray, by the way, if you wonder, if you ever want to work him, Ray's call sign in amateur radio is November 9, Juliet Alpha, okay? Uh, And he's just amazing. Ray's a great guy. Ray, how are you? How have you been? I'm doing all right. Is my video coming through? I see no video at this point. I see a good good picture of you, though. You're looking spry in that red shirt. Okay, that's that's rather interesting. It's showing that 
video is on. Let me try it again. All right. We got you here. There you are. Now I see you. I see a good buddy. That's my man. How are you, Ray? All righty. It's great uh, to see you, bad. man. Uh, this, this new promotion that I've received has been just keeping me busy. So I appreciate you accommodating me on my hit or miss schedule the last week or so. Ray, you're such a busy guy. And knowing how busy you are, that you would take this, this time with us, it means the world to me. Thank you for doing that, Ray. It's very, very kind of you. Thank you. Well, um, I, I got to get caught up on a little bit of the ICOM history. I wasn't expecting that when I when I called in. And, uh, yeah, that brought back some memories of seeing some of those old radios. That's great. That's great. We've got folks from around the world who are so excited. <laughs> Gunter in Germany literally screaming out, Woohoo, he's really here. Yep, that's really him. Alfred Lee, ICOM, totally awesome. Um Gunter hoping to win the lottery this weekend, then putting the IC7851 side by side with a Hibberling PT8000A. Dreams, dreams, dreams. Oh, Any man, questions Gunter, for Ray? I, I was hoping he would have started with the ICOM and adding the Hibberling. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Boy, wouldn't it have been something to get one of those 7850s? My goodness. Such a, a low production number. Oh. You know, if I, I, you're afraid if you buy one of those, you'd keep it in the box and never open it, just to keep it pristine. I do know one ham that bought two of them. One of them stayed in the box. He was a, um, oh, let me think. He had retired, and he was a clocksmith. Oh, really? So, yeah, it was, it was interesting. It resurfaced, and he was... I'm not sure if he got into medical pinch or what, but he was he was selling it. But I don't know whatever came of that one. I do know at our corporate headquarters in Kirkland, Washington, that we do have one in our ham shack. Really? I, we were supposed to sell them all. I just could not give up one of them. I mean, we, we had to have something there. And Mr. Inouye actually gave away the one that had serial number one. He gave no. it away to a friend of his here in the United States, and I got to hand deliver it. No way. What a story. Wow. And, and I bet Gunther would know who he is once I say that he's both a German ham and a U.S. ham and right now resides in the United States. Wow. What a, what a gift. And to have the honor of being able to hand deliver it to Ray, that had to be pretty special for you. It was, um, I had only known this ham through emails, and after delivering that radio, he's become a very good friend of mine. Congratulations. That's great. Ray, we've got field day coming up now, and it's a you know less than a month away. Talk about the 705. It's such a brilliant rig to bring out for field day and show off. Tell us about the, the capabilities as well as what what it brings to the table for a ham to bring that out on field day and show the world ham radio. I wouldn't say it's just for field day only. I mean, oh, there's, no, there's I don't mean that. I think it's there a great radio to bring dialogue right now for guys that are doing parks on the air. Are they going to do parks on the air or are they going to do field day? Or are they going to do a combination of both? Because it, it's a great backpack, uh, grab and go type radio you don't have to plan to take it out. You just grab it and have a good time with it. And um, sorry, I just had to reach over and grab the backpack. My green screen, it doesn't show up very well, but I mean, it looks good. This weighs a good 18 pounds with all my gear in it. So. So you can carry it's, your. It's right there to take. You can carry your wire antenna. You can carry extra battery. You can carry your rig. Everything in that. That's fantastic. How? Yes. With with the AH705, it it sets up real nicely with a wire kit antenna. Okay. How long is it going to work on battery power, Ray? Well, that's a loaded question. It depends on which battery you bring along with you. Okay. Let's I mean, say you, you've got. You've got the one that works on your handheld radio, like the ID51. You're going to get about three to four hours. Really depends on how much you transmit. 
But if you're like I am and a glutton for punishment, you bring along one or two lithium iron phosphate batteries. And the two that I have from BioNO, I got to take a look. But let's see. This is Ray Novak, I mean, by the way, from ICOM North America. I've got two of these, and let's see, 54 watt hours, it says four and a half amp hour. Perfect. So okay. I'll get eight to nine hours out of that. Perfect. Yep. I have a bio like 1220A. Said, so. I've got two of those. Now, if you're like Julian OH8STN, he's actually got a solar panel that keeps his lithium iron phosphate battery charged. And it's actually part of the, the top of the solar panel. So he runs all day off the solar panel because there's enough of a current rating that it will power the radio for full transmit and then run most of the night off of that uh, battery. Four and a half amp hour battery pack. It's fantastic. Yeah. I have a BioNO 1220A and I, I get plenty of use out of it. It does very, very well. So I'm sure on the 705, it'd do excellent. Uh, with the last time we had you on, we didn't talk enough for one ham about the 7610. Can you talk a little bit more, Ray, about the differences in the 7610 that it's not just two 7300s, and then I'm just going to let you go. Oh, man. I mean, yeah, I've seen that, that theory that you can get two 7300s and do as much, if not more, than a 7610. And... It, it pains me to, to see people fall for that because the 7610 has two major components that the 7300 does not have, and that is the Digicel pre-selector. And for those that hang out on 10 through 20, you know what? You're never going to use it. You're never going to notice it. It's not a big deal. But those that, that go 40, 80, and 160 meters, they know the value of the Digicel pre-selector. And... It has two of those, one for each independent receiver. And to give you an idea what grade or what class of radio ICOM introduced the Digicel pre-selector, it was in the 7800. Wow. Okay. So yeah. we, introduced, we introduced it in the 7800, which had two of them. Then it was in the 7700. And in the 7850, 7851, there's two of those in there. So it is proven technology that is in our flagship radios. The other part of it is the FPGA and the 7610 is powerful enough to give you the uh, IQ output, or I shouldn't say powerful enough, but it gives you the IQ output on the 7610. So that allows you to be able to do your things like uh, HD, SDR, and some of your SDR type products or software products that require an IQ output of a radio. All right. You you just don't have, have that capability. All right. To get two 7300s to track each other, you need uh, external peripherals to make that happen. Um, most computers won't deal with two rate two 7300s connected to do. Uh, your different uh, digital modes, things like that, to monitor multiple things. So it, it's it's really not the this the same thing. Well, plus, you know, one other thing I'd like to add, if you don't mind not trying to take away your thunder, one of the things I like about it, it's the lowest priced ham radio right now in the world that has diversity reception. It, it allows you to use two antennas, your better antenna for receive, and then transmit on the other if that's what you want to do. But you can do it on a 7610 for less money than any other ham radio made today. It's fantastic. And that's part of where I was going with the, uh, the two VFO tracking was that diversity reception capability with the radio. Yeah, there's a few things that I'd like to see it do that it does not do right now. But there's not a single radio out there that's perfect. Yep, I agree with that 100%. We're live with Ray Novak from ICOM North America. If you have a question, please feel free. Put it in the comments section. 
Ray's generous enough to give us his time here today. Ray, regarding your RSP software, the the optional software that you can run one of your radios through, say, a tablet or a laptop, is that done directly through the radio, or does it go through ICOM North America somehow through a back door and then to your computer? How does that work connecting to your radios? Well, you got me on that one. I was I was all getting prepared to say yes, it does both, but <laughs> you threw that little twist in there. No, the the one thing that's real nice about the ICOM software is it has a one to one communications path between the radio and the computer. There's no other offloading or some remote server that you have to go through. So when when you set it up the like the seventy six ten and the ninety seven yeah, 9700, both have the server built in, so you don't have to have a secondary computer. Where the 7300, you do. So there again, when you're looking at, is the 7610 really two 7300s? Um, no, no, it's not. You've, yeah. you've got the, the server, the processing capability to handle the server. And one of the other things that I meant to mention about the FPGA on the 7300, the design at the FPGA does a lot of the, the signal processing and things like that, but it offloads the signal to a separate DSP chip. Okay. Interesting. Where Interesting. on the 7610, it's all done. The DSP, the signal processing, all of that is done in the FPGA, not only for one receiver, but for both independent receivers. Interesting. And, and let me go a little further. You also use a commercial grade chip in the 7610, don't you? Yes. There, there was a lot of speculation when the first ones came out. We, we had some chips that were contaminated from the flow soldering uh, process that the adhesive for the heat sinks would not stick on the chip very well. There was another radio manufacturer that used FPGAs that had a similar issue but they did not go with the industrial grade. And what is meant by that is there's a heat sink on the bottom side of the FPGA that is then attached to the PC board. So you're getting double air, uh, cooling areas, one underneath the chip and then the, the heat sinks that are attached to the top of it. So we had a few of them that, that uh, you'd hear them clink around inside the box. What we ended up doing was putting a, a, an additional process in that cleaned the top of the chip so the adhesive would stick very nicely. Very good. And the, and adhesive, and the adhesive, and gosh, I remember seeing in some of the forums, well, let's put Gorilla Glue on it. It'll <laughs> hold it in place. <laughs> the adhesive that is used on the heat sinks is a heat conducting adhesive as well. So it helped bring off the heat from the processor. Okay, and you guys, interesting enough, Yesu does not use commercial grade. Um, they're using, you know, a lower grade for their chips, where ICOM is spending a little more money and putting the commercial grade chip in, which is fantastic. I think that's really good for longevity. Definitely, I think that's an advantage for for Yesu. Alfred Lee, well, no, nope. just just a caveat there. There are people that love Yesu. That's great for them. I do challenge them to come over and play around with the ICOM. Yeah, yeah. I, well, you know where I'm going, okay? <laughs> I I could show you the empty space right here, but, you know, you'd look and say, yeah, there's a there's an empty space. That's where the 7610 is going. So there you go. Alfred Lee, November 9, Juliet Alpha. I love this man. Gunter from Germany, Delta Kilo 5, Oscar, November Victor. I am really happy with my IC7200. IC7300, no need for a bigger model. I can use both radios, mobile, portable as well, as a fully working base station. That's a pretty good comment. Well, Gunter, my fingers are crossed that we will, maybe we will meet each other next year at Friedrichshafen. <laughs> Friedrichshafen, yeah, no kidding. Hey, at least Huntsville's still on, right? Uh, knock on wood. Yes, yes sir. sir. Yes, sir. William Myers, Kilo Alpha 8, Golf India Mike from the state of Wisconsin. Ray, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really like my ICOM 7300, and the reason that I purchased it was because of Larry. Oh, I didn't see the bottom. I'm sorry. It was because of Larry. Bless your heart, Will. Thank you. That's nice. Larry, what did you do? Twist his arm? 
I just, you know what? I just, I had, you know, I purchased 7,300 and I showed it on the channel a lot, you know, and people, I think people got to see what a great radio it is for the money. You just can't beat that. For, there's nothing on the market at that price point that gives you that kind of performance. It just doesn't exist. So whatever you guys did back there was wizardry. I'll tell you that. Rod Claire. Well, that, was, that was definitely a fun project. No kidding. Rod Claire, West Salem, Oregon. Hey, Larry, as long as we are wishing for the lottery, I need an IC7100 for my shack and an ID5100 for my son. When he passes his test, his call sign Kilo 7 LAP. He just, by the way, passed his exam. He went from technician to extra in one day, so that's pretty good. Uh, let's see oh, here. Um, I'm trying to look at all the questions here, try and make sure we get you everything. Um, okay, Martin from Holland, Papa Echo 9, Tango India Golf. D-Start capability, 7,300 in the future possible, like the 9,700, do you think? Uh, I'm not really sure. Um, and you know, that, that HF D star operation is really a gray area. I mean, um, yeah, we've got FM operation on 10 meters, but I know some of the guys here in the U S do their, their HF D star net. They'll, they'll try to go all the way to 80 meters to see how that plays. But, uh, no idea. There's nothing on the drawing board right now to replace the 7300. I mean, everybody always asks, when are you going to come out with something new? The question comes up all the time on the 7100. The thing is, when we come out with a new product, the price always goes up. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. I mean, are we ready to see the 7300 go back up to 1499.95 for the first year or so? I would Until say all the no. R&Ds <laughs> until all the R and D's uh, recovered, and then it starts dropping down again. Yeah, yeah. Cliff Bolts, Whiskey Delta Four, Oscar Bravo, Papa from Virginia, saying he loves the seventy six ten. That's good stuff, Cliff. Thank you for coming to the channel today, Ray. What do you think is the toughest part that ICOM has faced during this year and a half battle with the coronavirus? Oh, let me see here. The toughest thing is probably making sure I'm working, not goofing off. <laughs> I mean, we haven't we haven't traveled. My my first trip was two weeks ago out to Seattle. That was the first time I've flown in almost a year. Um, instead of going to ham fests, I ended up going to RV rallies and meeting new friends, uh, enjoying. Uh, being the only one in the group that was still working, I mean, wow. there are a bunch of retirees going, oh, well, um, how do you get along with us old people that are retired? And I go, Aww. well, you ought to see what a ham fest looks like. <laughs> I got a lot of old people that come and talk to me all the time. That's awesome, Ray. That's a great line. That's awesome, dude. And then, oh, then some of my, my friends that's watching this are probably going to give me a hard time and going, yeah, you'll you'll be lucky to see old age you keep up with a mouth like that. <laughs> but um, Well, you're in Texas. No, that, it's that, okay, that's man. That's probably the <laughs> biggest challenge, at least for ICOM America. ICOM Inc. in Japan, the biggest challenge is being able to finish product development when you're in an environment that – you're working from home. You don't have the 3D printers at home. You've got them back at the office. You don't have the uh, companies to work with that can do the CNC for a uh, a die-cast aluminum chassis. I mean, when you get your 7610, don't void the warranty by pulling off the covers, but if you just can't help yourself... When you pull the cover off, you're going to see everything is down inside the aluminum for both shielding as well as to dissipate the heat. Those kind of things people don't think about being able to engineer. I mean, yeah, you can take a computer home and do all the CAD work you want. But when you start getting into the final phases of uh, going to 3D rendering testing the circuits, getting in the lab to do the testing and and the full rack of Rody Schwartz equipment. I mean, you're not going to put that on a on a train in Japan 
and go home and then get it in your apartment to do testing. Right. So we've seen quite a few products that have been delayed. The ID52 was delayed because of it. Yeah. And then you cap it off with this catastrophic fire oh, that yeah. occurred at the AKM factories. Yep. And at first people are like, oh, well, it's not going to be that big of a deal. But, I mean, we've got a Cadillac uh, dealer here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that's saying they're only going to see 400 Cadillacs this year because of the production slowdowns. Wow. And, that's and, those, a- and 200 of those Cadillacs were already on their lot. Wow. And so many manufacturers are struggling with getting product from the factories, you know, whether it be chips or it's transistors or whatever, because factories are slowed down. It's just a very, very rough time. I mean, that was a good good answer. I like what you said. How hard has it been not to go to a lot of ham fests? I mean, your schedule really just went from 100 miles an hour doing ham fests and ham fairs and different events like that. To all of a sudden, wait a minute, what's going on here? It was like hitting a brick wall. I mean, at first it was like, hey, cool, we can relax a little bit. But then as we got into January, February, we start getting that, that itch and that scratch going, man, Orlando. Yeah. Oh, well, we're not doing Orlando this year. We ended up doing it virtually. I mean, that was fun to do the presentations, things like that. And then the, the real crusher was hamvention yeah yeah i mean everybody was sitting there hoping fingers crossed that it was that was going to happen uh we had to put pressure because hey we spend a lot of money to get ready for hamvention uh when you take a look at we have around 25 people that go we're looking at hotel rooms secured uh air flights all of those kind of things that's a lot of money that gets spent yeah yeah. And uh, l- luckily, the airlines have been good with us where they're not canceling our credits after a year because most of us had our flights booked for Dayton for 2020. Certainly. Yep. So now we're starting to be able to use some of those credits, but a lot of money was lost because of uh, uh, cancellation fees and things like that. Wow. We're live with Ray Novak. From ICOM North America, if you have a question for Ray, feel free and put it in the comment section. Ray, we appreciate you coming again. Thank you. Glenn Stevenson, all the way from Australia. Very good morning to you, my friend. Thank you for joining us today. He says, regards from Australia. He says, Ray, will there be a CW decode upgrade for the 7300 in the future, you think? I'd say study that 20 words a minute. There you go. That's going to be the easiest That's upgrade right, right there. That's but right. There, yeah. there are no plans to put CWD code in our radios. There you go. Alfred- I know a lot, of people, a lot of people ask about it. One of the things that I remember in my early days that you told everybody about at MFJ, mm-hmm. one of their decoders, when they first came out with it, I'm like, oh, this is going to be cool. I can actually, instead of banging my head against the wall in a CW contest, I can have a trusty backup. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Hardwired into the radio, all of this stuff, setting the levels, playing around with it during non-contest times. Thought I had it working, and as soon as the contest hit, it became one heck of a T and E. Oh gosh, reader. yes, yeah. I, you know, and I have a, a four six four, uh, the MFJ four six four here, a great decoder and reader, fantastic. But learning it actually. Spending the time, which it takes time. It really does. And folks, you have my apologies. I've been showing you, uh, you know, the Farnsworth method from the um, MFJ products. I'll get back to that because I believe it's important for people to learn CW, myself included. It's a very good skill to have. It used to be part of licensing in the U.S. It no longer is. And I I do believe it is good. And by the way, Glenn, thank you for joining today's show. Appreciate it. Greg Robinson. Congrats on your promotion, Ray, from Greg, his call sign, Kilo Alpha 7, Mike Delta Mike. Why don't you tell us about this promotion you received? And I I must say, well-deserved, my friend. One one thing, though, on the CW, I would recommend anybody that is studying CW right now, do not go the five words a minute, the 15 words a minute, to the 20 words a minute. Each time, you've got to relearn it. Get accustomed to the faster uh, send rates. 
that way you're listening to the rhythm of what what's coming to you it becomes a lot easier once you get to the faster uh the faster word per minute rates good good advice thank you ray that's good advice and, and watching watching some of the guys that just are phenomenal with it like in in 6 mj where they do little sprints to see how many they can um how many call signs they can capture in a, a time period. And I've seen run rates of over 400 cues an hour. Wow. Wow. That's a and, person that either sleeps very well at night or somebody that cannot get to sleep. <laughs> Just like one or the other. That's a fast working brain. It, it was interesting talking to him. I mean, he's, he's some type of mutant uh, life form. He was talking about doing a CW. Oh, you laugh, Larry. He's telling me about working 10,000 cues in a 48-hour period. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Wow. And some of it he sends by hand, but most of it is all keyboard. But where's the phenomenal thing is he's telling me of run rates about 225 to 250 cues an hour. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty good. And he goes, but that was on 20 meters. I was also running 200 cues an hour on 40. Same time? Running SO2R. Wow. Two wow. complete separate keyboards, two radios, amplifiers, everything. Unbelievable. They had lockouts, so he could not transmit at the same time. Uh, you, can, you can actually search on YouTube for N6MJ uh, CW contest, and you'll come across one where... It's just mind blowing watching him do it, and he sits there and he does it for forty eight hours. Unbelievable! That's you know what he's been richly blessed, no question, no question. Yes, sir. Ray, um, quick question: Say someone buys a seventy six ten, right, and they get themselves a Wellbrook loop. Maybe they buy themselves a different kind of receive loop antenna, right? They put it okay. on the back of the seventy six ten. Does there have is there any protection? Involved with the 7610. Time out. Time out. Never put a receive antenna on the back of any manufacturer's radio. Always have ty some type of circuit to protect it. There you go. There you go. So where I, was, I was trying to get there, buddy. I really was. I was trying to get there. Maybe I should have worded it, it differently for you. Well, no, 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 no. That's that's what everybody thinks. Oh, well, there's a received antenna jack. They read through the manual. It talks about how it automatically does something. Mm -hmm. You get enough RF in the area, a relay sticks. Yes. You got problems. Exactly. Always have protection. Yes. DX Engineering, by the way, makes a fantastic product to help with that. So it's a way to protect your receive part from RF from your transmitting antenna. And when you're doing this, folks, if you're going to be using a receive, always, always make sure it is at least 15 meters away from that transmit antenna. That will help to protect your receive side on that end, on your receiver. Because these things are so sensitive. Not side by side? No. You know, actually, Ray, they, they took that out last year. Yeah. Well, it's, like, it's a coronavirus thing. It's, it's one of those things. We got a, a new person here, Fabiano Moser. Welcome to the channel. It's very nice to have you here. He has a question for you. He says, greetings from your friends in Lisbon. Any chance the ID-52 arrives in Europe before Christmas 2021? His call sign, Charlie Tango 7, Alpha Bravo Delta. If I was a betting man, I would not put money on it before christmas of this year all right all right there you go i mean it, it all comes down to that the the chips from the akm factory yeah and that's i, I mean you're not the only ones everyone's waiting on chips no i mean there's there's some manufacturers that decided the chips that they had in stock they would they would focus those chips to their lamb mobile division instead of to the ham radio division mm -hmm. um the japanese automotive manufacturers downgraded their sales by 60 billion yen wow so i mean this this was catastrophic for a lot of industries yes absolutely and what was really painful was we got fcc certification in november and then received two days after certification the bad news that production was delayed wow Talk now, about Larry, being we did hit. skip over 
we did skip over that question about the promotion. I just will put a quick plug in on that, and then we can yeah, continue on. That's, that's great. Um, what what happened last month is the guy that had been working in our marine and aviation divisions uh, got a job offer he couldn't refuse. So he decided to move on. The position opened up, and they asked me if I would take over the marine and aviation industry or divisions as well as the amateur division. Congratulations, Ray. Sincerely, congratulations. I couldn't go to a better person. Yeah. Somebody like Martin Jew speaks so highly of you. That says an awful lot in my eyes because I think the world of him. He's my, he's my very favorite in ham radio. Such a man of integrity. Well, that means Bolt. there's going to be another check in the mail to Martin then. <laughs> you, better, yeah, you better get in there. Cliff Bolts, Whiskey Delta 4, Oscar Bravo Papa from, from uh, Virginia. My two grandsons, ages 10 and 12, are studying to get their licenses. When they get them, I'm going to be getting them each a 7300. That's pretty cool. Nicola. Oh, wow. Um, are you adopting? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, uh, Will, if there's, uh, if there's any way that uh, you might want to, you know, put an extra bedroom in there. Nikolai is here from Romania. He said, uh, hello, everyone. Sorry if my question is repetitive. I'd like to know what advice do you give for a beginner ham? Wow. Yeah, that's a tough one. I, I always say start with a good antenna. No, good no, feed no, line. no, no. Yes, 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 yes. No, find friends. Yeah, well, that get, you know what? That's the, true. The, yeah, that's the, true. The biggest, the, the biggest advantage to a new ham is finding friends that have experienced a lot of the pains. That's good. Yeah, I like that. Yep, you um, got I me mean, there. I ham, mean, ham radio is about talking to and, and social networking with people. Mm-hmm. Um, YouTube, finding guys like Larry um, and others out there that have great channels to show you different products, different experiences. Mm -hmm. Those are always good. Uh, use whatever is your favorite search engine to find uh, hams in a local community. Yes. Yeah. And, and go from there. Uh, but I would not recommend joining the first club you attend absolutely yeah get to see get to see what all is out there make sure they're they're like-minded people and every community has good clubs and bad clubs the the worst mistake you can that you could do is get tied to one that really doesn't share the same common interests because with any hobby it becomes painful for you Ray, that's well said. Thank you. That's well said. I, I, I know my first ham experience, yes, I got my ham license at MFJ back in 89. I got my license, bought my first radio, had it in my vehicle, identified on the local repeater. And the comment that came back to me was, KB5KCL, uh, I don't see you on our club registry. Oh, no. You need oh, to be a club member to use our repeater. Wow. That that was my first ham radio experience. That's too bad. That's Luckily, too bad. Martin Jew talked me in off the ledge because I'm like, I don't want to deal with people that are narrow-minded like this. Absolutely not. I agree with you. And he goes, Ray, Ray, it's not like that everywhere. Yeah. Come here and listen. And we had a good time listening to people talk on HF. And at that point, that was like, hey, I need to upgrade. Yeah, that's great. Can I have some time off to study? No, get back to work. <laughs> He's got such a collection of radios, doesn't he? My gosh. Yes, he does. My gosh. I, I just, every time I go in, in his office, every time I've been in there, I just stare at the walls. Cause, and, the, and the walls are like, you know, the, 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 the shelves are like bending from the weight of all these things. He just has the who's who of what's what. That's for sure. And every radio in his collection has a story. Yeah. In every pile that you see in his office, he can tell you where everything is. His mind yeah. is phenomenal. It really, you know, um, I was talking to Richard this week. In October will be 49 years. 
and you know obviously next year 50 years lord willing he you know does it what a story you know what to to be in a business that long just a great great man you know you were mentored by a good man in ham radio you really were and it shows it shows gunter from germany dk5 onv studying currently for the u.s general class license and extra class that will help you tremendously gunter just because you only get a few more frequencies on 20 40 80 and so forth those are dx frequencies <laughs> that's the whole point that's where the dx is and that's why you want those rod claire from west salem i have an id 5100a in my pickup i love it how do i convince cool. my local repeaters to set up d star do you have any suggestions uh, sit tight and follow our web page. Uh, we have the new third generation D-Star repeaters. We will be launching soon, sometime in June, a new program. These new repeaters are both analog as well as D-Star. If the club agrees to run the repeater in mixed mode, there will be an interesting program for them. Great. Thank you, Ray. That's good. Greg Robinson, thank you for joining the show today. He says, CW Academy is a great online school for learning CW. Greg, we appreciate you coming to the channel today. Thank you for that. I come, ha a big question from Gunter again in uh, Germany. He said, my question, Ray, where can I buy ICOM merchandise like rain jackets, wind jackets, beanies, long warm underpants for my portable activations? <laughs> Maybe a tent with an ICOM emblem on it. He, you know, Ray, he, he was in a club station. Things kind of went, went a little bit bad, but he still goes out. I mean, this guy carries a wagon behind his bike filled with his gear, including, a, you know, there's his 7200 right there. And he just works out in the field. And it could be, you know, crummy weather, whatever. He keeps things dry. But he does it almost religiously every night. He's truly a ham radio DX guy that just loves it. So when he's asking about gear like that, he's real serious. Do you guys sell any of that? Unfortunately, we do not. I do want to make a quick plug for CW Academy. I firmly believe in what the CW Ops Guide do with the CW Academy, um, ICOM sponsors their, um, oh, I can't remember the, the exact name for it, but they have a couple times a year, they'll have a CW Ops contest. And we believe in what they're doing, so we sponsor what, what they do. Uh, as far as Gunter and on some of the ICOM swag stuff, we do not sell it. I would recommend looking up DL1QQ, and oh, I've got to do a quick look up. Stand by here. I've got another friend over there. Um, let me pull up Karsten's call sign. He's DM9 Echo Echo, Delta Mike 9 Echo Echo, or Delta Lima 1 Quack Quack. Um, Get in touch with either one of those. I did leave some ICOM t-shirts with them uh, when I visited them a couple years ago. They may have some of them left. Um, if not, I'll be bringing some with me when I go to uh, Friedrichshafen next, next year. Thank you, Ray. Appreciate that. Dave from Temecula has joined us. Whiskey Six Charlie Radio Tango. Thank you for being here. Steve O USA, congrats on your promotion, Ray. He is November 2, Alpha Juliet. Steve, thank you for joining the show today. Nice to have you. Alfred Lee, Ray Novak, and ICOM pays forward to communities in need. Happy to see good work outside the hobby and rebuilding the country for all good. Thank you, Ray, for all wow. the hard work in helping those in need. That's a very high compliment, Ray. And Thank you deserve you. it. You really do. You deserve it. ICOM does so much for clubs and for the scouts and for so many organizations. Can you talk a little bit about that program where you're helping other people who are getting into ham radio? Maybe it's a club or maybe the boy, just talk about the Boy Scout program, what you've done for them. Well, we do have, if you do a search for ICOM in the community. We outline all the different things that we support and sponsor and, and help out. 
uh, for the scouts uh, through the K2 BSA website. We've got a station loan program for uh, the scouting community that's trying to get their radio merit badge that might not have a club station to go to. And really to help them get the radio merit badge uh, over a weekend, we send out a 7300 power supply, an AH710 uh, antenna. And boy, that one's created a lot of, a lot of controversy because it's it's a um, a wideband antenna that does not require an antenna tuner. When we first started doing that with the 7200 that didn't have an antenna tuner, everybody wanted to modify the package, and we're like, just put the antenna on the radio. It's going to have a good SWR. You'll do fine. And once they did that, it, people were able to talk all around the world with it. But we. Go, I know. Uh, well, we yeah. we do things. I mentioned earlier about CW Ops and how we work with them. We do uh, a couple of uh, QSO party groups. Uh, the Hawaiian QSO party is a real cool one, where the trophy is actually a sur uh, miniature surfboard. Uh, the QSO, the state QSO party contest that's been going on. We sponsor that. Uh, A RRL's sweepstakes plaque program uh, yeah we definitely believe in giving back to the community we're not the cheapest radios out there we do use some of our profits to to help support these different groups and and things like that thank you ray thanks for doing that had a question in the comment section here i need to address real quick i want to make sure that i get it correct to you because yeah you know it was said uh Pobut's cracker box out of eugene oregon which DX protection model was Larry talking about? I'm talking about something in DX engineering cells. It's called the receiver guard 5000 HD and 5000 receiver front end protectors. You can find those at DX engineering. Uh, just search for the 5000 HD. It's there to protect when you're using a receive loop antenna. All right. Ernest Wilson. We'll give this the final question, Ray. I know you got to get back to work. Please ask Ray when ICOM is going to release their next big HF amplifier that has been in the works. We'd love that QRO, man. His call sign. And Ernest, thank you, buddy. Whiskey 3, Golf Union, Yankee. Thanks, Ray. I was wondering when somebody was going to ask about the PW2. <laughs> that one got put on indefinite hold be, um, right at the beginning of COVID. Oh, boy. Uh, okay. And unfortunately, I don't have a... a information on when we will start doing that again okay what well, would be that here's i have one question for you okay this is a smile thing one what would be you think the chances of icom coming out with a 200 watt version of the 7610 as much as i would love to see it um i, I don't see it coming down the pipe don't you okay yeah, just curious. No. Yeah. Uh, if if anything, right now we've got a hole in our well, we've got two gaping holes right now in our product line for Europe. Uh, the mm -hmm. 7851 has been discontinued in Europe. It's still in production for the United States. It had to do with some of the regulatory uh, changes that that occurred in Europe. I see. Uh, the second one is the 7700. The 7700 was was discontinued. I know ICOM Canada still has one in their warehouse, but right now the 7610 for a lot of areas is the top of the line, yes. the flagship radio. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, but but uh, right now 7851 is still in production. I think that's really cool. It, it's, it is such an amazing super heterodyne radio. It really is. I... Um, I'd love to try one someday. That'd be really cool. But right now, I have a hole here to the right of me where that 7610 is going to go. You have my word. We've been live well, with you had some of the, You had some of the big multi-multis on the East Coast. K3LR has got one 7850, and I think he's either got 12 or 13 7851s. WE3C. 
uh, had outfitted his multi multi with seventy eight fifty ones. So I mean, on the East Coast, they're pretty heavily used. I bet. Yeah. Well, when you have a good product and you put a lot of work into it, and you have the experience that ICOM has with building it, best super heterodyne out there, definitely. We've been live with Ray Novak from ICOM North America. Ray, any final words for folks that are in ham radio missing the ham fairs, the ham fest, the get-togethers, and all the barbecues? <laughs> um, barbecues have at home. You can always have a good one there. <laughs> but uh, the ham fest, there are a few virtual ones. We are starting to see some of the smaller ones come back. And uh, Huntsville, Alabama in August. Mm-hmm. That's going to be packed. You know that. That's going to be really busy. It, it will be interesting. I know our we started seeing boat shows return back to the circuit uh, in November. They had the Miami boat show, the Fort Lauderdale boat show. They just finished having Sun and Fun in Lakeland, Florida in April. Uh, everything is all go for the Oshkosh Air Show, which we will... I used to go to the Oshkosh Air Show on vacation and set up a set up a special event station. Really? I'm still setting up the special event station. A buddy of mine gets to come and play ham radio while I got to be in the booth. Oh boy! <laughs> of course, of course. Somebody's got to do the heavy lifting, Ray. You know that. There, you know, Andy so Kelly from the maybe UK. Maybe I'll play a maybe I'll play a little bit radio at night if I'm not exhausted from the show. Yeah, no kidding. But got, it should be a lot time. of fun. 20's been open at night lately, so that's a good thing. We're getting some some decent nighttime propagation. Uh, I'll give the last question to the UK. This is a good one. If, you know, for him, it's important. I want to make sure he's honored here. Andy Cowley, thank you for coming. His question, any thoughts about the ICOM 7100 ever having a color screen? Yep, there's a lot of thought about that. And uh, as we mentioned earlier about the upgrade to a 7300 i believe it was uh if if we ever do upgrade the 7100 it's probably going to take it back up to 1249 to 1299 with that color screen where right now today they're selling 850 and below mm -hmm. yeah. so i mean a lot of new hams that are coming in buying that radio yeah it'd be great to have it color but uh you're, you're going to be paying for all the upgrades we will do more than just change the the display we will do a a full radio uh upgrade at that point very good we've been live with ray novak from icom north america ray we want to thank you sincerely for your time today i know you're busy you took a lot of time out of your day to talk to the folks today thank you for doing that all right thank you and just to just to go on record there is nothing on the drawing board to replace the 7100 at this time there you go. And there's some good news. 7100 is a great transceiver. Ray, thank you. Thank you. God bless you, buddy. All the best to you and your family, my friend. All righty. Thank you. You're welcome. Take care. I've been live with Ray Novak from ICOM North America. And I appreciate Ray being on the show. That was a joy. And I hope you enjoyed it as well. If you have a question for ICOM, they're real easy and very accessible people to get a hold of. Find them online or just simply... Contact Ray, <laughs> N-Y-J-A, that's his call sign. Just don't fill his email up. That would be bad. Try and reach them, you know, by calling or emailing the company. Thanks for watching Am Radio Live, folks. We'll have Michael Walker next week on the show from Flex Radio. He'll be taking all your questions regarding Flex Radio products and what's going on over there in Austin, Texas. We're looking forward to that. That will be on Wednesday. This is right now scheduled for Wednesday at 2030 UTC for Mike Walker from Flex Radio. Till next time, we did the sign off today for Ray. It is from Jeff, it's from Japan. It really is. This is a Japanese sign off for their television day, and we typically close our shows with those. So today is coming from Japan. It is something in honor of ICOM for all the work that they've done and for having Ray on today, which to me is pretty special. It's always nice to have a friend on. Raise a good man. Thanks for watching Ham Radio Live. I don't monetize the channel. I just ask you to subscribe. I thank you for your kindness and all of your questions. Until tomorrow at 20 UTC, my name is Larry. My call sign is Kilo 7, Hotel November. God bless you, wherever you may be. Goodbye, everybody.
らは日本テレビでそうです Tune in tomorrow. Same bat time, same bat channel.